it is a new year and if you're like me you probably thought of a million ways that you can update and redecorate your house however i am sure you're feeling this prices of everything have gone up and it's starting to put a damper on all of those future dreams and ideas that we have for our homes however i am here today to share some of my best look for less dupes from high-end stores that way you can stay inspired and still go on with those beautiful ideas that you wish to do for your home this year Hey there, my name is Yami. I am your Latina next door. Welcome back to Mi Casa. I have been recreating high-end decor pieces for the home for several years now, and you might not have seen all of them. So I decided to take the best of the best, both my favorites and subscriber favorites, right here so that you can stay inspired and perhaps come up with ideas of your own in order to decorate for less this year. I'll make sure to include a link to the playlist where you can find all of the original Look For Less videos. That way, if you want some more information on one of them, you can just simply click below. So I happened to come across these beautiful bronze ring pillar candle holders on Pottery Barn's website. I really love the way they looked. However, the smaller one is $69 and the larger one is $89. So the pair would have turned out to be $158 and of course tax. So I thought these would be so wonderful to recreate. So I found these two rings on Amazon. You can very well use embroidery hoops for this, and I've used them on many DIYs before. However, I wanted something thicker and wider. But one of them is eight inches and the other one is 10 inches in diameter. I needed a round disc for where I'm gonna place the candle and I came across these ornaments that I've had for a couple of years. I bought them at half off a couple of years ago and I've had them in my stash and I just honestly have not had an opportunity to make these over so i figured it was a perfect time to use them for something so the first thing i did was remove the little top pieces with my miter shears and then i would sand the area where i'd cut it off to make sure it was nice and smooth then the little round disc needed kind of a little lip as you see in this picture so i needed to come up with something and I had this stuff called Edge Mate, and it's basically what you put at the edge of plywood to give it a nice clean look. As you can see, it's used like on cabinets and stuff. These were from my studio, and I had this small piece left over. So I wrapped it around the disc to get the exact measurement that I needed for it to go all the way around. I could have left it the size it was, however, I wanted it to be a little bit more shallow. So all I did was take the edge mate tape and just slice it right down the middle to cut it in half and make the lip a little bit less deep. And I just used the box cutter for this. Next, I needed like a little bit of a dowel and I just happened to have this little scrap piece on hand. I swear I keep everything, but I'm glad I did because now it works for this. And I just needed to cut it down into two small pieces. After I cut them down, I made sure to sand both ends to get any splintering off and just make sure that both ends were nice and level. I also had several pieces like this of plywood left over from when my husband was building my cabinets for my studio. So he ended up cutting them down into smaller pieces for me so I can use as the base for these candle holders. Now, if you don't happen to have any scrap wood like this in your home, you can always use these rectangular wood plaques that you can find at Hobby Lobby or Michael's. Since one of the rings was larger than the other, I also made sure that my husband cut one of the bases larger than the other as well. So after everything was cut, it was time to assemble. And the first thing I did was add that little edge mate tape on the border of that round disc so that I can get that little lip that I want from the original candle holders. And all I did was use some hot glue for this and work my way very slowly and patiently to make sure that it covered very well and it adhered properly. So once I was done with those, it was time to address the little bases made out of the plywood. Now, 
The original piece was a metal candle holder and I didn't want it to look like it was a plywood piece of wood. So on the rough edges, there were some that were actually very smooth, but there was a couple of the edges that were a little raw and it would have been really noticeable if I had painted them. So I took some plastic wood and basically just took a little spatula, spread it on there to make it smooth, let it dry, and then I sanded it later. Next, it was time to assemble. And I used wood glue because I wanted a very secure bond. And the first thing I did was place the hoop onto the base. Next, I needed to add the dowel. So that's what went on top of the center part of the hoop. And then finally, I added the round disc to the top of the little dowel. I repeated it for the second one and then I set these out to dry. Once they were both dry, I took some sandpaper and began to smooth out the areas where I had applied the plastic wood just to make sure that everything was nice and smooth. And I also sanded any other areas that I found that were uneven or might have had a little bit of a splinter or two. Once that was complete, it was time to paint. And the original pieces were a metallic black, obviously since they were metal and I wanted to have a shine to them as well. However, I wanted to do a nice solid base coat of black paint. So I started off with giving everything a full coat of just black chalk paint. Then for the shiny coat, I used my Folk Art brush metal paint in brushed black. And I applied it all throughout everything as well to give it that metal look. The only thing left to do was to let these dry and they were ready for use. So here's how we did. The originals would have cost $158 for the pair, but I was able to create mine for only $17. Another one of my all-time favorite Look For Less dupes were these vases from a Pottery Barn as well. They no longer carry these, and I just fell in love with these blue and white vases, and I had to recreate them myself. I had found this vase at my local thrift store, which I love the shape but did not like the painting on it, and I spray painted it in white. Next, I found these stencils at my local Hobby Lobby and I thought it would be perfect for this face. Of course, you can always use any kind of stencil that you may already have or you find at your local store. Of course, the first thing I did was tape off the bottom of the vase and paint it kind of like a mud color. Next, with that same color, I took a fan brush and began to distress the piece. Once I was done with this step, I let it dry completely before going on to the next. I took the color Prussian Blue and what I did was I cut out the stencil in a smaller piece and I began to stencil on the pattern throughout the vase just freehand and I used a sponge brush for this. It didn't have to be perfect because neither were the vases from Pottery Barn. Then I came back in with some matchsticks and began to add another color of blue and just added more dots throughout the initial pattern from the stencil. Then I began to work on these other two bases that I have had for quite some time and I did the same thing. I spray painted them and I taped them up and I distressed them, added the same color and used a different stencil this time to add that beautiful pattern at the top and that's how these came out and to this day I still have these bases. They are just as beautiful as I made them the very first day and I just love the way they look. The great thing about this is that you can use any size vase, any shape vase, and recreate any piece that you see online just like this. The first ones were originally $49 to $79, and again, you can't find these anymore online, and mine only cost $11 to make. For this one, I'm gonna take you way back to the beginning and I had given you guys three options and you guys chose these candle holders from Pottery Barn. 
Now we're going to start off really simple. All you need is some glass faces or hurricanes that you can find at your local thrift stores. They don't have to be the same size. They don't have to be the same height because these can vary. Now, if you see anything like this in your local thrift store, definitely grab it. I know it doesn't look like much, but I promise that this is going to turn out great. If you can't find anything like this, all you need is a wood plaque from your local Hobby Lobby or Michaels, as well as an old candlestick that you can cut down to size. Now this next piece is optional. You can use embroidery hoops for the top detail of the candle holders as well. And if you want extra stability, I would suggest getting some wood forms like this for the bases. First thing I did was clean the candle holders that I had purchased and then use some E6000 in order to add that little wood piece that I showed you earlier to the top of the candlestick. Now in order to show you that this could be done with some remaining items in your home that you no longer use, I am going to cut down this candlestick in order to make one from scratch. You're first going to take that little round wood form and glue it to the top of the candlestick that you just cut down and then glue that piece to the larger plaque for the base. Just make sure that it's nice and centered when you glue it down. Now if you want to add the top detail to the candle holders, definitely use an embroidery hoop and cut it down to size in order to fit snugly on the top. I cut off the sections that had the metal pieces on them, then I glued two together and added any additional pieces that I needed. Now if you don't want to go this extra step, just leave it as is, or you can even paint the top portion of the base in order to make it look like it has this metal rim. Now using some metallic spray paint, I went ahead and sprayed all of the pieces at once. And this is what it should look like when it's all said and done. This is the metal one and here is the one that I made from scratch of all the different wood pieces. Now you want to assemble your pieces. Make sure to use a glue like E6000 in order to adhere them properly. Now you can always use another piece of that circle plaque and add it to the top if you wish to enclose it like I'm showing you here. Now here is what the two embroidery hoops that I glued together for this candle holder looks like so that you can see the difference between the two. Now here is how they turned out. Pardon my camera skills, this was when I first started YouTube. However, I think they turned out great. And here is a comparison side by side, what they cost originally and what I recreated them for. For this next look for less tube, I'm going to be recreating these wall candle sconces from Kirkland's. And all you're going to need is one pine dog fence picket from your local hardware store. You're going to cut your fence picket into two two foot sections and then two more five and a half inch sections. Next, you're going to cut another five and a half inch section and that one you're going to cut in half into two equal sections. Once your sections are cut, get a wood stain and stain all of your pieces. Make sure to let them all dry completely. Then what I did, since I did want this to look very rustic, I came in and sanded everything once everything was dry. Now if you're wondering why I have so many pieces, it's because I made two different sets and I actually gave one away to my subscribers at the time. Next I took some white chalk paint and then after I had it on the brush I watered it down with a little bit of water and then I began to brush it all over the pieces for a whitewashed effect. Now as you can see I am painting these rather rustic because that was what the style was at the time. However you can paint them a solid color and update them for your taste. Once everything is dry, you're going to take one of the five and a half inch pieces and place it where you want your candles to sit on. Then with some wood glue and a nail gun, put those together. Now you don't have to have a nail gun for this. You can always do it with a finishing nail and a hammer. Then for that smaller little piece that you cut in half, it's got to be cut at a 45 degree angle as you can see here in order for it to fit underneath the shelf and hold it up. The next thing you want to do is add your mounting hardware to the back so that you can hang it on your wall. And for extra durability, take some clear wax and seal your paint finish. This is how they turned out and I think they look absolutely amazing. And of course, here's the comparison of the originals as well as the recreation, as well as how much I saved. Next, I am going to be recreating these volcanic ash apples from Valor Designs, ranging from $26 to $32, and I thought these were perfect for setting on a bookshelf or on a tabletop. 
I had these two apples from Dollar Tree at the time and I decided to try this on one of them. The first thing I did was scuff the surface since it was very shiny and slick. Then I took some chalk paint and I began putting it all over the surface of the apple. And not all DIYs go perfectly as planned. I decided that I was going to change up the gray because it was too earthy for me at the time. And then I began adding some little specks of white throughout. However, this wasn't working for me either. So I went back to the original color and added some white paint throughout, but I didn't mix it thoroughly. That way you can see variations in the paint. And this is what actually helped bring it to life. Now with me adding the specks on it and kind of being rough with the last application of the white specks throughout, it kind of gave it a grainy cement like texture. And then adding this on top, nice and thick, added to that cement look as well. So this is actually how it turned out and I love how it all worked out in the end. And since I pretty much had all of the paints on hand, this recreation only cost me one dollar. For the next look for Let's Dupe, I'm going to be recreating this beaded round wood mirror. And this was back in the time when Pier 1 stores were closing and I was kind of browsing their online inventory that was remaining. This one was on sale for $104. You're going to need a large wooden round like this and at the time i got this at home depot for only ten dollars i'm sure they've gone up since then you're going to need also a round mirror i got this one at michael's with a coupon and of course you're going to need round wooden half beads i got these ones on amazon and of course you're going to need some paint as well as some wax and at the time this is what i used for this now first I poured some wax into a section of this little Dollar Tree container and then I added some paints to the other sections and I began to mix it up in order to create a custom color. Now it did take me some trial and error because I was trying to get the right shade and as you can see here I'm applying this color and it's kind of transparent because I did add it to the wax and I am just looking for a nice beachy look but I want to be able to see the wood grain through. Once I was done with the wood round, I did the same thing to the half round beads. And of course, I probably should have taped them down so that they weren't as messy, but hey, you live and you learn. Next, I placed my mirror on top of the wood round and made sure it was centered before I adhered it onto the surface. I used a pencil to lightly mark where I was going to place it. I removed as much as I could of the felt pads that were on the back of the mirror and then I used E6000 in order to adhere the mirror onto the wood round. Now once you adhere the mirror you're going to want to wait till it completely dries so that it doesn't shift while you do the next step. And of course for this next step you're going to want to glue down all those half rounds on the perimeter of the mirror and as you can see here I had a little helper that day. Once the half round beads were secure, I went back in with some white paint and began to lightly brush on some white all across the top of the mirror. I wanted it to have that whitewash look and I just wanted it to all be done at the same time. So I just went lightly across the entire surface, taking my time and adding more as I went. Now you can go as heavy handed or as lightly as you want. And I also came back in and with a smaller brush, I began to kind of fill in the cracks between all of the beads just to make it look like the white was more accumulated in all those little crevices. And what I would do is I would go in with a brush and then I would smooth it out with a cloth. Of course, I did not forget to do the perimeter of the piece. Once I was done, I made sure to clean off the mirror to make sure it didn't have any paint left. And here is how it turned out. Now I did not add hardware on the back for hanging it up at the time because I just had it sitting up on my mantle like this, but it was also an option. And of 
course, here is how I did. I did not include the paints because I already had them left over from other projects, but for the wood round mirror and the beads, I only spent $22. While browsing online, I came across this beautiful whitewash wooden barn door with glass face on Kirkland's website. I love the look, but at $75, it was out of my price range, so I decided to make my own. So I found this frame over at my local Goodwill. It was only $1.50 because they were having a 50% off green tag sale. And as you can see, this actually was $19.99 from Hobby Lobby. So this was a great score. Next, I had these poplar pieces of wood that I always have on hand. These are from Home Depot and only $1.05 a piece. You guys know I always use those. And I took them and started making markings on each end for each of the corners. This was going to be my little barn door X. Next, I used my modder saw kit in order to cut across those lines. Once I was done with one end, I would go back to the frame, make sure it fits snugly, drew my lines again, and then cut it the other side. I sanded the edges a little bit and then fit them in my frame. Keeping that first piece of wood in there, I came back with another piece of poplar and I traced the other two pieces that would go on the other side to complete the X. Then I removed the pieces of poplar wood and gave them two coats of white chalk paint. I did the same thing to the entire frame, making sure to also paint the frame that goes around it. After both coats were dry, I took my ruler and I made markings in order to make the faux wood slats that would go on the barn door. I marked the center and then the center of each side and then I did the same thing to the other side of the frame. Then with a piece of poster board that fit just inside the frame, I went ahead and used that as my flat edge to draw from one point to the other. All I used was a pencil and it gave me the perfect lines for it. Next, it was time to adhere the X and I just used some of the wood glue from Dollar Tree. It actually works pretty well. And then after the X was in place, I put some heavy paint little jars that I had to keep it down and flat on the surface while it dried. I had this empty jar. I don't even know where it came from. So I wanted to go ahead and use that as my vase. And we picked this little item up from Home Depot. I'm not sure what the heck it's called, but you guys know what it is. You pull it and it tightens. So I figured it was malleable enough to cut to fit around our jar. But apparently it wasn't soft enough for me to cut. Lucky enough, I have the Latino engineer who has stronger hands than I do and he cut it for me. He also helped me cut it down and bend it in order to fit around the neck of the jar and onto the frame. With some E6000, I adhered this metal piece onto the neck of the jar, and then to hold it in place while it dried, I used a hair tie. I let it sit overnight in order for it to dry and adhere completely, and then the next day, my husband helped out with screwing it onto the X frame, and that was it. And I don't know if you noticed, but I ended up using this piece because I loved it so much for my daughter's bathroom reveal in our last house when we renovated it and before we moved. And I only ended up using $5 in order to recreate this piece. Most of the pieces I already had on hand, including that jar and those florals. So don't underestimate the power of items you may have already lying around in your home. This next one is another Kirkland stoop, and while it's a fall item, definitely stick around because seasonal items can get very expensive, and this recreation actually made it into a magazine, and I'll show that to you at the end of the DIY. So I looked through my seasonal craft stash and I found these pumpkin picks that I had from Hobby Lobby from a previous clearance. I had these pumpkin picks from Dollar Tree as well. I have two packs here, but I only ended up using a couple of the orange ones. I also had a stash of these pine cones, again, from previous projects that were just left over and I had just in case I wanted to add some more pine cones for my holiday decor. I started out by wanting to use this ribbon. However, it was not wired, so I was not able to use it in the end and I had to replace it. And then finally, I purchased this grapevine wreath at Hobby Lobby. This wreath form cost me $4.99. 
And then I had all these greenery stems from just previous projects. You know how sometimes you use flowers and just parts of stems or bushes? Well, yeah, I keep all of the ones in case I need them for future projects. So I took some of my Nantucket blue, it's the same blue that I used for my Christmas in July truck sign, and give some of my pumpkins a couple of coats. Now I know that some of the pumpkins on the original wreath were velvet pumpkins, but in order to keep this cost effective, I just decided to use what I had on hand, and that was paint. Now since I like the placement and the number of pumpkins that the original wreath had, I decided to only go with six, and I used two of the Dollar Tree orange pumpkin picks and then all of my leftover Hobby Lobby picks from previous years for a total of three white and three blue pumpkins. Then I took my full cart brushed metal in bronze paint and I proceeded to paint all of the stems in order to elevate their look a little bit. Now the original wreath also had berry stems, so I took some old stems, this is just one little bush that I had left over from Dollar Tree last year, and painted the little berries in French blue acrylic paint. Now I'm not going to lie, it was a little difficult getting that paint in all of those little nooks and crevices, trying to make sure no orange peeked through, but I promise it was totally worth it. And again, to follow the inspiration, it did have two different types of berries with slightly different colors. So I decided to go with a really pretty grayish green color that I had. It's called Morning Mist. And I decided to just use, again, a more leftover Dollar Tree berries from previous years. So after everything was painted, I kind of gathered all of my items. And then I started cutting all the pieces of greenery that I wanted to use. Now, as you can see, I'll have all sorts of leaves, but I did want to actually have a little bit of consistency when it came to the color. I didn't want anything too bright green. I wanted a lot of muted colors that would work well with fall and lots of soft textured leaves like lamb's ear and eucalyptus. So once I thought I had enough greenery, I decided to go ahead and start placing them in. I left the stems so I can stick them in through the wreath form a little bit easier. Anything with a smaller stem, I would actually add some hot glue to the end and then stick it in the wreath. That way it would adhere and stick better. And because I didn't have an abundance of greenery, because I was using what I had, I had to be really strategic in how I placed things, making sure I covered everything to the best way possible and I even left the area on top where the bow was going to go without greenery to make the rest of it fuller. And I also added the pumpkins in the same places where the original wreath had them. Now at first I just inserted them just to hold their places but then later on I came in and cut the stems and glued them down. And then I did the same thing with the pine cones. I would go in, place them where I wanted them, and then I would adhere them with hot glue. So when I came down to the little berries, these were kind of long, so I stuck one end inside the wreath form, and then I hot glued the other end to keep it in place. And then I proceeded to distribute them evenly throughout the wreath. And since the larger berries were very light and were in smaller chunks, all I needed to do was hot glue them right on. And then I just proceeded to continue filling the wreath until I was happy with the result. And then came for the ribbon. Now this is the ribbon that I ended up using because it was wired. I had it on hand. I had bought it because I thought it was so beautiful and it just turned out to be the perfect color match to the blue pumpkins. All right, so I'm not that great with bows and I'm sure there's probably a better way of doing this, but I cut three pieces all the same length and I kind of looped them around like this and held them at the center. In order to keep them that way, I did add a little dot of hot glue to all of the ends to keep that little loop in place. And I was wearing my finger protectors here because this wreath happened to give me my worst hot glue gun burn ever. <laughs> So if you see these at Dollar Tree, get you some and use them before you get burned. Then you want to overlap them over each other, making an X and then one straight down the middle in the back. Then I took a little piece of elastic and then just tied them together to hold the bow in place. At this point, I do like to fluff up my ribbon just to make sure it's not going to look crazy before I make anything permanent on it. So when I'm happy with it, I add a ribbon over the center of it to go over and make like the little legs that kind of hang down. And then I hot glue the front part of it down to the bow to keep it in place. And then I flip it over and then I twist the back part of the ribbon so that the front facing part of the ribbon faces forward. If not, then you'll see the unfinished 
back part of the ribbon. I glue the ribbon down in the back and then I come to the front and I tuck under that front piece of the ribbon and I glue it in place as well in order to hold everything in place. Then I cut the ends of the ribbon to make sure that they are both even and give them little angled cuts to make them a little bit nicer. I use the little elastic on the back of the bow to adhere it to the wreath form. And with that, the wreath is finally done. And here is the wreath as promised. It was featured in Country Sampler Farmhouse Magazine and it was from Wreaths Around the Seasons. I had already painted my door blue so it looked even better. And because of the supplies that I already had on hand in order to recreate this, I only spent $8. Okay, so I have been wanting a plate rack for my kitchen for a very long time. And while searching online, I came across this rustic plate rack on Etsy. Now it doesn't show a price because this is a custom order piece and once somebody orders it, the price goes away. But it was listed at $349. Now I did find this unfinished version in a little bit different measurement from the same vendor and this one is on sale for $368.99. Regardless, this was a price that I was not going to pay for a plate rack, especially since I had a lot of remnants of wood in my stash. Now we did end up going to Home Depot for a couple of things because we didn't have enough wood, but it was well worth it. So we took a good look at the pictures and based on their measurements and what it looked like, we came up with our very own design based off of it. Now there's only one small detail that we changed up a little bit for my plate rack and I'll share that later on in the video. Now the first thing we did was rip down the boards that we had to make thinner, more lower profile shelves because I didn't want it too deep, of course. And then we also tried our hand at creating our own dowels. Now, if you're interested in making one of these yourself and want the measurements, here are the measurements that we ended up using for our plate rack. And feel free to do a screenshot so that you can save it. Now, real quick, the one difference that we did was, if you can see here, there is a small little shelf on the bottom so that you can add any little items that you want to display. However, with three little kids, I could not afford to have anything displayed like that on a very narrow shelf. That was not gonna work for me. So I eliminated that one from my plans. Now, after building this, I learned a few things and I will be adding an extra dowel to each of the shelves. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in the video. So just stay tuned in case you do want to make this. It will make a difference. Now there was a second thing where I kind of deviated from the plans. I didn't want a sharp edge at the very top. I wanted to taper it. So I made sure to mark where the back support was gonna be. And then with a sanding disc that I had on hand, I just traced the edge of it to kind of cut that piece off and make it a little bit more rounder and custom at the top. And I used a jigsaw in order to cut this out. Then after all the pieces were cut, I made sure to give everything a nice sanding, making sure there was no splinters, and also evening out the wood tones since a few of the boards were a little older. We did end up buying one at Home Depot because we did not have enough, and sanding them down made the old ones look brand new again. When we were ready to assemble, we lined up both sides and then we assembled each of the shelves. It was best to attach the shelves together and have them ready so that we can go ahead and attach them to each side. We started off with wood glue, of course, and then the Latino engineer volunteered his skills and used his nail gun. Don't worry, I used it too. And we did the same thing to the second shelf. 
Now only two of the shelves will need the supports underneath. The bottom shelf will not need this. I added wood glue to the sides of the shelves and then we measured where we wanted to place them along the side pieces. So what we did was we measured 12 inches from the top of the bottom shelf to the underneath part of the top shelf. And we did that for both of them to keep the spaces even. And then we attached it with a nail gun. Then we repeated the same thing on the other side. We added extra nails to reinforce the joints. And then we proceeded to add the dowels. We used wood glue and nails for this as well. And we spaced the dowels two inches above the shelf. Then I gave the entire thing a coat of stain. Now I didn't want anything too dark. I wanted something to look rustic, but I also didn't want it to be too dark on the very light walls. So I went with something with a medium stain. I let the stain dry overnight and then I came back in with clear wax the following day. I applied it with a wax brush and then what I do is leave it to sit overnight again and then the following day I come back and I buff it with a lint free cloth. Finally, the only thing left to do was to add some hardware to hang it up. We centered it with our chandelier in our kitchen and we made sure it was level and then we installed it. And here is how it turned out. Now you're probably gonna laugh because I don't have very many dishes on here. I'm still trying to find um, really nice one of a kind pieces with hints of blue. And it's been very hard to find at my local thrift stores. So um, I have a few pieces, but I can definitely use some more. Now, propping the plates up like this made me a little nervous. We even made it slightly narrower than the original piece. And our plates still didn't touch the dowels. So I'll be attaching another dowel to the bottom center of the shelf so that once the plate sits up like this it actually touches the bottom and sits upright without sliding um, right now the plates are actually adhered to the wall with painters tape so that they won't slide down but that's the one thing that i found out after it was already installed and i started putting my plates up so here is how it turned out and we only ended up spending 12 dollars on this because we had most of the supplies already on hand for the next look for less, we're going to be recreating this flock tabletop tree and it's not necessarily for the tree that I want to share this because I think I could do better than what I actually ended up doing, but it's more for the base and I want to show you how you can recreate that base with items you already have in your home. For this video, I'll be using these little containers that you can find at your local Dollar Tree. Now you can use any box that you may have on hand. Now basically what you want to do is take jumbo popsicle sticks and using these shears I am going to be cutting these up in order to match the sides of each of these little boxes. Now if you are ever wondering or curious about any of the tools that I'm using most of these are already linked in my description box below. First you're going to want to cut all of the sticks that are going to go vertical and you're going to want to hot glue them onto each of the sides. Once you have those down then you can measure the ones that are going to go across horizontally. You're going to cut those down and you're going to adhere them as well with hot glue in order to create that square shape. Once you're done with that side you are then going to repeat this on all four sides. Next, you're going to take some more popsicle sticks and you're going to recreate that X on all four sides. And then after you cut them, you're just going to add them on with hot glue again. This step is not difficult at all, but it will take you a little bit of time to get all the pieces cut out and adhered properly on all the sides. Once everything is glued down, you're going to take some white chalk paint and you're going to give the entire piece a full coat of white paint. Once that chalk paint is dry, you're going to want to take some aged glaze, and I used to use this stuff all of the time. This stuff was pretty awesome, and all you need is a little rag, and you're just going to dip your finger in it, and you're just going to rub it throughout the entire piece, making sure you get into those nooks and crevices, and this will give it an antique look with almost a wood grain feel. It's actually pretty cool stuff. 
Now for the tree, I actually used one of the Dollar Tree Christmas trees and I spray painted it white to give it a flock look. Of course, this part can look a little bit better. It's what I used at the time. And then what I did was I added some foam to the bottom of the container and I cut off the little end pieces of the foots of the tree. That way it can fit inside of the box. Then I glued everything down and inserted the tree into the base. I added more bits of floral foam as well as some of this moss and that was pretty much it for this DIY and again I'm not really fond of the actual tree part but I absolutely love that little faux crate. I think you can make this in any size and it just looks so good. Their version was $119 and mine was only seven. And if I had left out that tree and maybe used something that I already had on hand, it would have been even cheaper. For this next look for less, I am gonna be recreating this trellis mirror from a Pottery Barn. I had purchased this mirror at Goodwill for under $6. And this is what we're gonna use in order to recreate this. The first thing I did was tape off the mirror and paint it with some white chalk paint. Next, I purchased these square dowels. Yes, they make square dowels and you can find them at Hobby Lobby in the wood section. And I began to paint these white as well. Once they were painted, I began to place them on the mirror to see how they would look once I began to create the grid. Now I just put them up against the mirror like this and began to mark them. And I also, just to make sure, would take measurements just to make sure that I was being consistent. And then using my little saw kit, I would cut them down to size. I would then sand off the ends and put them in place, making sure that it was a nice snug fit. Then once the vertical ones were in place, I'd come in and begin to do the perpendicular ones and I would measure the areas and also make adequate markings on both sides of the mirror so that I can make sure that I space them out evenly. I would also mark the dowels where I needed to cut them and then once I cut them, I put them in place. And here is just a snippet of the progress as I continued. Next, I had to design the diamonds that went in the middle. So I took the two center rectangles and marked the centers of each one of them. So I knew exactly where to place each of the individual pieces to create those diamonds. I placed the dowels down, made my markings, and then made the cuts. Once I inserted them, here is how they looked. Now, they weren't secure at this point, so I went in and added wood glue on all the seams. Then I removed the grid once everything was dry, sanded it down, and repainted the grid. Then I cleaned the mirror off and reattached the grid back onto the mirror with some E6000. Last thing I did was take a paper towel with a little bit of gray paint and added some distressed areas all along the mirror and this is how it turned out. Now the original was on sale for $199 and mine only cost me $10 for the mirror and the dowels. The next thing I wanted to recreate was this beautiful marble and brass handle tray that I found online on house. I had a scrap piece of wood left over from a previous project which was the perfect size and I found these handles online that looked almost exactly like the original. I marked the center of either end of the board and then I drilled the holes to match the new hardware. Now this is supposed to be a marble tray, so I came in with some wood filler and began to smooth out all of the imperfections and all of the knots on the wood. Once it was dry, I came back in and smoothed everything out with a sanding block. Then it was time to add the marble and I used this marble contact paper which I found on Amazon and it was just the perfect look and thickness. This is some pretty high quality marble paper and I was very happy with it. So I cut it down to size to fit over the 
wood piece. I removed the backing from the contact paper, laid the wood on it and flipped it over. And then with a card, I began to smooth out the surface, making sure that there were no bubbles left behind. I took my time with this and when I reached the edges, I really wanted a nice sharp edge with no bubbling or wrinkling of the paper and I just took my time with this pulling and using that card again in order to make it very, very smooth. The corners were a little bit tricky, but I took my time and when I cut them, I made sure to cut them precise and fold over those edges as smoothly as I could. I tried to use the least amount of paper on the corners so not to make them bulky. I removed the excess and then folded it over very tightly. And this is how tight those edges look. You can barely even see any seams. Lastly, I took another piece of contact paper and I added it to the bottom so that I didn't have any wood exposed. The last thing I needed to do was find those previously drilled holes and puncture them with a box cutter so that I can apply my handles. I inserted the bolts and then I placed the handle on top and I screwed it from underneath. They stayed on there very secure and this is how it turned out. I've had this tray for several years and I have actually used it in various areas in my home. So it's very practical. The original was $175 and I recreated it for only $18. This next DIY is probably one of my all time favorites. And it was during a time where sunburst mirrors were all the rage, but I don't care <laughs> whether or not they're in style or not. I still love mine very much and I've had it till this day. Now there wasn't one particular one that I really liked, but I did gather inspiration from several online and what I used to recreate it were these shims. Now these shims were from Home Depot. They don't make the exact ones, the exact size anymore, but they still do carry shims obviously, and you can use those. You'll also need some wood glue and something to hold your pieces together. You'll also need a mirror. This one's from Dollar Tree back when it was only a dollar. And this is where my husband stepped in because he didn't think I can apply wood glue correctly on my own. <laughs> Anyways, so what we did here was add wood glue on either side of these shims and glued them together like this. We used five on either side going up and one in the center. And we liked the varying colors, so I made sure not to put too many of the same colors all at once. That way there was even more variation in these portions of the sunburst. I guess you can call them the rays. We would put a few together and clamp them down like this, and then we would add more as they would dry. Now, the reason you didn't do the entire ray by itself all at once was because due to the angle of the rays, when you clamp them down, they would tend to want to slide out. And so you had to do little portions like this. So then once the center was done, we would take and do the sides and use some rubber bands to hold them down so that those could dry. So in the end, we did three in the center and four on either side, as you can see here, and they would be drying at the same time. Once those dry, we put these three pieces together, which would end up being one in the center all the way at the top and then five on either side if you count them all. Then, of course, you would clamp those three pieces together with more wood glue to create that run ray. All right, I hope I haven't lost you yet. Of course, this is something that takes a lot of patience, but I promise you the end result is well worth it. Because now you're gonna take another single shingle and you're gonna apply it on either side of that one ray and you're gonna apply it higher than the last shim that you put on either end. Now this step is important because this will differentiate the rays when you put them side by side. If not, you would have two rays with two shims, the same height, butting up against each other. I hope that makes sense. Then it's all about putting the entire starburst together and you want to hold one of the rays 
on one side with something a little bit heavy that way it stays still you want to add a ton of wood glue to either side of those rays and then you're going to press firmly together and you're going to begin to start going round and round And you're just going to continue the same process as you work your way around to create the entire starburst form. Now, if you're worried that your starburst won't come out a perfect circle, there will be a chance to make minor adjustments for the entire starburst for it to come out perfectly round. This is what I love about this. It doesn't have to be actually perfect in the center because that part is going to be covered up by the mirror. So if you do have to shift a little bit here or there, you will still have a little bit of play. And this is what my starburst ended up looking like when I made it all the way around. Now, in order to add even more adhesion and further stability for the entire sunburst, I added more wood glue along the center, as you can see here, and I was very gentle. I quickly removed the mirror from its frame and then I placed it on top of all of that wood glue that I had just placed and let this dry and harden. Once that was dry, I flipped it over and began to add even more glue on the back, applying it with a sponge brush to make sure I get it through all of those crevices to further reinforce this piece. It does end up becoming a pretty heavy piece, so I wanted to make sure it would never fall apart. And this is what the back looked like with all of that wood glue dried. The last thing I needed to do was add a border around the frame. And I had this embroidery hoop that pretty much matched the same exact size of it. I ended up painting it a little bit just so that it would match the rest of the shims. And then I applied it onto the mirror with some E6000. Finally, it was time to add the mounting hardware on the back and my husband thought it would be best to actually have a wire hanging mount so that it would hang a little bit better and kind of spread the pressure out since it was such a heavy piece. And if you recall, when we made over our last master bedroom in our previous home, we also put the sunburst mirror back in there and it looked amazing even after one move. It's in storage right now and I cannot wait to pull it out and incorporate it in our new farmhouse as well. And I found one pretty similar, I guess, as close as I can get it to the one that I created and they were running about $282 and I only made mine for $35 total. This Two-tone and geometric square wall plaque was another one that I wanted to recreate as soon as I saw it. I just thought it was so interesting that it had so many layers and it had kind of like a coastal feel. So I decided to give it a shot. Now for this project, I decided to use the 36 inch poplar wood pieces that you can find at Home Depot. These are only a dollar and five cents a piece and I used 10 for this project. Now you will need to cut these down and you can use this small miter saw kit, which is only $10. I'll go ahead and link to it below, or you can use an electric miter saw. You're also going to need some form of tape measure. And I personally like to use my fabric one. The original piece of art was 30 inches square, but this was too big for me. So I cut these down to 24 inches and I cut four of them in this size. Now, once everything was cut, I made sure to sand all of the edges to make sure they were nice and smooth. I used a hot glue gun for this project since it's going to be fairly light and it holds very well. Also, since all of the pieces are 24 inches in length, in order to make a perfect square, you're going to need to attach them like you see here. All right, so now that the frame is done, we're going to move to the next part, which is the large X in the back. So for this, I placed two pieces of wood diagonally across the square and I made my marks with a pencil as to where I needed to make my cuts. I cut these pieces, sanded them, and then I attached them to the frame with some hot glue as well. Okay. 
Then in order to add a little bit more stability to the corners, I took some large popsicle sticks, trace them on the back corners, cut them down and hot glue them to the ends. That way it made the frame a little bit more sturdier. All right, so now we move on to the white square part of the frame. Okay, so for this, you're gonna need two more poplar pieces. I cut them in half and I used 45 degree angles to cut the ends down. The outside measurement is gonna be 18 inches and the inside measurement is gonna be 15 inches. You're gonna assemble these into a square and you're gonna hot glue these pieces together as well. I cut down more popsicle sticks and use them to reinforce the joints on this as well. Hold off attaching this to the larger frame for right now. Now we're gonna assemble the final piece, which is a smaller square with the four pieces of wood at all of its corners. For this, you're gonna cut four pieces of wood, the outer edge being 10 inches and the inner edge being seven inches. Again, assemble your square and then put together with more hot glue. Use a couple more popsicle sticks to reinforce those corners as well. Now you're gonna place a new piece of poplar wood all the way from the top to the bottom down the center of the frame. Make sure the piece of wood is inside of the frame and then lay down the small square directly on top of it, making sure it's centered. To make sure, use some measuring tape at the top and the bottom and make sure that they're both in the same distance from the frame. Make your markings with a pencil and then cut your pieces. Now we did use a jigsaw for this because it's a little bit trickier. However, you can use a small mini miter saw kit or if you have a heavy duty box cutter, you can score the wood and snap it. Make sure you cut four of these. After they're cut, sand them down and then glue them on to your small square. Then use more popsicle sticks to reinforce these joints as well. Okay, so the next step is to either stain or paint these pieces. Now, the large square was white, so I had my cute little helper who was dying to get her hands on some paint and paint the large square white. All right, so after that one was done, we used some of the pickling wash in the color Driftwood since I wanted it to have a coastal feel. And we went ahead and used this on the smaller square. Then finally, for the large frame and the X, I used some of the wood tint in Walnut and I went ahead and stained everything. I used a chip brush to apply and I wiped off any excess. After all of the pieces were dried, I went ahead and sanded over them to give them a light distressing and then I began to assemble. I laid the white frame down first, making sure it was even from all four corners, and I used hot glue to apply it onto the X. Then I placed the third piece right on top. Now, since this was the final piece that was gonna kind of hold everything together, I used some E6000 to adhere this square onto the white one. I then flipped over the piece and began hot gluing all of the pieces together from behind to make sure that everything was nice and secure. I made sure to hold on to any pieces that needed a little bit of extra pressure until the hot glue dried. That way it was nice and secure. And here is how it turned out. So the original cost $60 and I was able to recreate it almost exactly the same for $10.50. For this dupe, we're gonna be doing the Marina table lamp. And this retails for $598. It is a large lamp and it has a rope base. I love this lamp because it's neutral and it can go with any color scheme, but it also has that coastal vibe without that cheesiness nautical factor. For me, it's a beautiful lamp with a lot of texture, but at $598, I could never justify this purchase. And upon closer inspection, when I zoomed in on the picture, I saw a rope seam on the front. 
at $598, I better not see a seam. So I had this lamp that I thrifted last year and I shared it with you guys in one of my previous thrift store hauls. It only cost me $8.99 and I love the size and the shape. However, after I bought it, I really didn't do anything with it because I really wanted to do something special. And I came across this rope at Hobby Lobby. You can find this in the floral ribbon section. Now it is $9.99 a roll. However, you know they always go on sale. So I got these for $5 a piece. The next step was to prime and I use this Krylon primer that I had left over in my garage and I wanted to prime the lamp. Now this might seem a little superfluous, but hear me out. Because it was a blue color, I did not want to have any chance that any of that blue was going to poke through any of the rope after I put it on top of it. So adding a primer on it, not only did it make the surface a little bit rougher because it was a smooth lamp and it would give the rope something to grip on, but if any of that original lamp poked through, it wouldn't be blue. It would be a nice neutral white color. I didn't paint it, I just primed it. Now, once it was dry, I removed all of my painter's tape and I made sure to cover everything very nicely so that none of the spray paint would get on it, including the cord. Whenever you're flipping a thrift uh, store items like this, you do wanna do a really good job of taking care of them, even though they are thrifted while you make them over. It'll make them look that much better. Now, I wanted to start on the back of the lamp. So I cut the end of the rope really straight. I applied dollops of hot glue on the ends so that it wouldn't fray. And then when I put it on the lamp, I made sure to butt it up against the cord as much as possible. And then I began working my way around very carefully, adding a little bit of hot glue on the rope as I went. When I got to the other side where I had started, I made sure to get it as close to the cord as possible and right above the previous layer. And then I kept working my way around. I added glue on every part of the rope. Some people might skip this and just apply it every so often, but no, not me. I wanted to make sure that that rope was on there and that was not going anywhere. Plus, I wanted to make sure that it stayed nice and taut all the way around. So not only was I hot gluing it and pressing it on to the lamp, I was also pushing it down a little bit so it would sit directly on top of the previous rope below it. So remember, this is not a time to skimp on hot glue. Use it at your leisure. Now, when applying your second strand of rope, make sure that you double check how it's coming out of your roll. The second roll I had to undo completely because it was wrapped on there in the opposite direction as my previous one, so the rope was facing the wrong way. So make sure you double check that if you do this. I also wanted to talk about the seams. I have a little bit of extra rope here as you will see however i am not gonna bring that all the way around and finish it off i am gonna stop and i am gonna cut it where that back cord is i want all of my rope seams on the back where that first initial one was created or added on and this way if you look at the lamp from the front or either side you will never see an end of a rope or the start of a rope because let's face it, we always face our cords to the back wall. So it is highly unlikely that someone would see those unsightly seams, okay? Now this lamp took three of these rope spools. Now I went all the way to the top with my rope. And then when I got there, I cut it very close to the end. And then I took my hot glue, put it on the edge of it to make sure it doesn't unravel and then I pushed it in kind of into itself that way you wouldn't see that end of that either finally I made sure everything was secure I removed all of the hot glue little strands and all it needed was a lampshade that I had at home from a previous lamp and it was complete
So here's how we did. The original lamp was $598 and with all the materials, including the lamp that I purchased, I only spent $24 for mine. All right, for this next dupe, we're gonna be doing the Pueto vases from Serena and Lily. Now, these are two vases. The small one is $148 and the second one is $198. Now, I found these at my local Goodwill. Thrift stores are never lacking in vases, but you do have to be very picky when you want to create something that's very high end. Now, the one thing I was looking for was that neckline. I wanted it to look like it had a very nice rim, so I was able to find that. My second thing is I wanted it to be thick glass. I was very picky when I picked these up, no pun intended, but I didn't want that very thin, cheap glass that you get most of the time when you get a vase of flowers delivered. You know the vases I'm talking about. So again, when creating high-end dupes, always make sure it's nice, thick, solid glass and it has a silhouette you're looking for. Now, as you saw, one of these cost me $2.99 and the other one a $3.99. So they were very reasonable. I made sure to clean them very good and remove any sticky residue off of them. Then I covered them in painter's tape and some paper, making sure that nothing that I didn't want painted was exposed. Finally, right before I was ready to paint these, I did add a little bit of rubbing alcohol and I cleaned everything one last time to make sure there was absolutely nothing left that would prevent my paint from sticking to the glass. I used the same primer that I used for my lamp. And with the vases facing downward, I began to spray paint the primer. Now, it was a really cold day this day, and it isn't really recommended to spray paint below a certain temperature because your paint won't adhere or dry properly. Now, if you do find yourself in the situation like I did, really light, small strokes at a time works very well. Don't go heavy on the spray paint and make sure you do it in a sunny area where it can get some of that natural heat. Now for the actual paint, I'm using this Krylon Color Master in white gloss. It's also some spray paint that I had in the garage that was left over from a previous project. And I use this again, applying the same way that I did the primer with really light, soft strokes and not doing a lot of coverage at a time. I gave them at least one night to dry so that the paint would cure properly before removing any of the painter's tape. Now I made sure to do this very carefully because I did not want to mess up that line and all it needed were some really beautiful florals and that was it. So for this, the original vases would have been $346 for the pair, but for mine, I only spent $7 for both. Now, for probably my most ambitious look for less dupe is this Portland Bone Inlay Tray. For $698, that is more than a car note for something that's going to go on your coffee table. I love this because it had that beautiful blue and coastal look, but I was not about to pay that much. So this is what I came up with. I found this tray at my local Goodwill as well. Now it was in a little bit rough condition, but it was the perfect size and shape. And at only $3.99 and the fact that it was originally from Crate and Barrel, I was sold. The first thing I did was wipe any sticky residue off of it and then I sanded it down. Now this had a very glossy, slick surface and I wanted to make sure that my paint adhered on it. Plus it had several chips and I wanted to smooth those out before going over them with new paint. And I'll be using some DIY paint today. I am gonna be using again that Sandy Blonde, but this time I'm gonna be mixing it up with some White Swan to lighten it up to create that bone color. As you can see, it's a lot lighter than the original Sandy Blonde. And I began to apply it all over the tray. Now, because this is a very red tray, I did give this two coats of this paint. And next I went to my Cricut and I created the pattern that was on the 
inlay of the tray from scratch. Now, if you are in love with this pattern as much as I am, I wanted to let you know that I did create a pattern for you. I have a free SVG file in my printables library on my website that you can download and you can use it on any cutting machine. For this, I created a stencil and one of the ways that I save money whenever I use my cutting machine to create dupes like this is I just use leftover contact paper that I might have on hand. It works just fine. I still use the transfer tape application. Everything works great. However, my transfer tape for this was super sticky. I forgot to put a little bit of lint on it from like a towel and removing every single last piece of this almost drove me to the edge i'm not gonna lie this does take some precise handiwork however i created the pattern so that it would fit onto itself if you needed to duplicate this and needed to cut smaller pieces like i did here it all worked out fine but this was something that took quite a bit and I also made sure to add the border around the outside, just like the original tray. Next, I applied tape to the outside of the tray so that I would be able to paint the pattern from the original tray. And then I also needed to apply tape on the inside of the tray so I wouldn't get paint on certain areas that didn't require it. Next, I went into my paint stash and just took some colors <laughs> and blended them all together until I came to the exact paint color from the tray. I mean, it's almost exact. I initially started using a stencil brush, but it was taking way too much time and I was already fatigued with all of those little decals that I had to adhere onto the tray, so I said, screw this <laughs> we're going with an easier application and i just use a regular brush and i just applied it softly on the top trying not to oversaturate it and it worked with a little bit of patience that i still had left and i did two coats of this as well now for the fun part or it looks fun on camera but it wasn't <laughs> I had to remove each individual piece and I'll be honest with you, this was gruesome, but the more I pulled off, the more satisfied I was. However, I did come across the fact that the little weeding tool would sometimes stab the wood and remove the original paint job from underneath. It was an older tray, so I knew there was going to be touch ups, but you know, I did have to touch up along the way. I would weed some, then I would touch up some areas that I would expose. That way it would dry by the time I would finish weeding. But look at this pattern. Isn't this just, it's gorgeous. I, I, I was so excited when I finally started seeing this come together. Of course, after I finished painting, it was time to remove all of that tape as well and it didn't want to come off in one piece either this tray really did give me a run for my money when i finally removed all of the tape i gave it another once over and i touched up any remaining areas that were kind of bugging me and really needed a little bit more of attention then finally when i was content and or exhausted, I decided it was time to seal and I used some of DIY Paints Clear Wax and I gave everything a nice generous coat of wax to seal everything and preserve that beautiful pattern that I had created. And this is how she turned out. So here's how we did. The original tray was $698 and I only paid $4 for the tray because I had everything else on hand. So for this next look for less, I am going to be recreating this Kirkland's Quatrefoil wall mirror that goes for $84.99. 
I actually happen to have a quatrefoil mirror in my basement. I've had this for several years and I wasn't too fond of the color at this point. It wasn't going with my furniture and I thought this would be the perfect opportunity to make it over into something beautiful. Now remember, this can be done with any size and shape mirror. Now I want to protect my mirror, so I'm gonna go ahead and apply painter's tape all around so that I don't paint on it. And I'm trying to place it underneath the lip of the mirror so I can make sure and get all of the edges straight down as close to the mirror as possible. Then after I'm done, I'm gonna take these half round wooden beads and place them all along the border. And all I'm doing here is just placing them for right now. I wanna make sure that I get the spacing correct and get everything right the first time. I will have to shift some of these wood beads around and I don't want to end up at the other side where I have a gap and it just doesn't look right. Many times I've seen people try to use these and instead of measuring the spaces first and doing kind of a dry run, they just kind of start gluing them right away and sometimes it doesn't end up being perfectly even on the other side and you want a professional look on this, at least I do. So putting them down first and making adjustments is priority. So after all of the beads have been laid down and your spacing is nice and evenly distributed, you want to hot glue these down. That is really all you need. And just have to make sure that the surface that you're applying this on has no debris and it's completely wiped down. That way it gets the best adhesion. And all I'm doing here is picking one up and applying hot glue and placing it back down right where it was. Next, I'm taking DIY Paints Dark and Decrepit Liquid Patina. And this is basically a stain and glaze in one. You can apply it very lightly or you can deepen the color. And it has a beautiful sheen to the finish. I did start off with a rag, but then I wasn't able to get in between those nooks and crannies between each of the wooden half beads. So I decided to get a small artist brush instead. Now if you notice when I was applying it with a rag it was actually going on lighter and now that I'm applying it with the brush it goes on darker and if you add on layers you can deepen the color of the stain or you can keep it light like I am. Next I'm going to take the color white swan and I'm just going to take a larger artist brush and I'm going to start brushing it on both sides of the beads. Now I'm not going for perfection here. The original mirror is very rustic and has a lot of whitewashing and distressing and that's exactly what I'm going to do with this one. Because I am painting white on black, I will need two coats of this white paint. So after the two coats are dry, I'm going to go back in with a damp cloth and what I'm going to do is I'm going to wet distress it which is basically rough it on the edges and high parts and remove some of that white paint that I applied. And so once I'm done with that I'm going to take some of DIY paints clear wax and I'm going to apply it all over the mirror making sure I get into all of the nooks and crannies. Now, if you're happy with how this looks, you can certainly stop here. However, I did want mine to look that worn and more rustic way that the original one looked. I really like that style, so I'm going to add a few more things. After I'm done with the clear wax, I am going to add my white wax. And I'm just going to take a lint-free cloth. I usually have an old t-shirt of my husband's and I cut little pieces off of them. And I'm just going to be applying it on the outside of each of those beads. Kind of getting some of that white wax on it, but not on it completely. So that it looks like the paint is kind of coming up from the sides and the beads are like popping out from the paint, if that even makes sense. <laughs> I just don't want it to look like the beads are just on top of it. And much like earlier, I started off with a cloth, but then I ended up using a really small brush to apply the wax all around. Then I took a clean brush and I just began kind of brushing everything in order to smooth those edges of where I had painted 
and make the transition a little bit smoother and then I would come back in with a paper towel and remove any white wax off the top of the beads. I let this sit overnight and this is how the mirror turned out. So here's how we did. The original mirror was $85 and mine was only $36 to recreate. Now if you recall, this mirror ended up going into my parents' guest bathroom makeover that I did for them a little while ago. So for this next look for Les Dupe, I'm going to be recreating this bright and floor lamp from Serena and Lily. And it's on Serena and Lily's website for $898. The base of the lamp is a nice smooth white finish with beautiful detail work and you can get the lampshade in two options. You can get it white or you can do a natural wicker lampshade, which is more my taste. But at that price, let's be honest, the lamp better do more than just turn on and off. And as luck would have it, I would be walking down my Goodwill a, a few weeks ago and I came across this really nice floor lamp it was in actually really good condition the base was wood it had a nice detail work just like my inspiration piece and i did get it for twelve dollars and 99 cents which is a little pricey but given the fact that it is a floor lamp i thought it was still a good deal so the first thing i needed to do was remove the lampshade and get it prepped for painting I heated the price tag a little bit with my hair dryer so that it would come off a little bit easier and I used some Goo Gone to remove any excess residue that was still remaining on the actual stand. Next I used some painter's tape to cover the bulb socket on the top of it as well as the cord at the base of the lamp. Next, I took some spray paint and I'm using Rust-Oleum's white in a gloss. I started at the bottom of the lamp and I use small light strokes when spray painting and then I began to work my way up the base. I gave this three coats overall, and since it was a bright and sunny day, it didn't take very long between coats for the paint to dry. Once everything was nice and dry, I removed all of the painter's tape. Now, since the original shade had a built-in harp, like already attached to the shade, I had to purchase this other one. And the reason I'm showing you all this is because this one's pretty cool. I found it on Amazon and I'll link to it below, but this one allows you to adjust the height of your harp, which is something that I've actually never seen. It has these cute little areas where you can click the long piece and shorten it or lengthen it as much as you want. Now the kit also comes with several bases and this is where you're going to like hook the harp on and as you can see this one doesn't work because the little socket is already in there. This one is too wide and of course it came with a third one and this one was just right. So I like that about this too. It definitely gives you options no matter what kind of thrifted lamp you may find. Then all you do is take the piece that comes with your lamp that screws directly onto your light bulb socket and just screw it down and it will hold that little base in place. Next, for the lampshade, I was able to find this lampshade made from seagrass at my local at home for $40. Yes, this is a pretty big splurge for a look for less but this is pretty typical as far as price is concerned now i went ahead and put this on on a higher setting just to show you all that you don't want to see any of that light bulb socket again which makes this little harp so handy all you have to do is push them up and go to the 
very first setting and as you'll see this looks so much better now the lamp harp came with this little finial that goes on top but honestly it was small so i decided to go ahead and buy this one it's 4.99 and i bought it when i bought the lampshade and it just goes so much better with the lampshade color and it really pulls the look together because that one was just too small for my taste and here is how this dupe turned out All right, let's check the comparisons. The original lamp cost $898 and mine only ended up costing me 75 total. This next look for less dupe is from Serena and Lily as well and it's the South Beach tray for $298. Larger trays go for even more and it's basically a glossy white tray with a grass cloth bottom. So I purchased this tray at Hobby Lobby a couple of years ago and I only paid $4 for it on clearance. And honestly, I've been using it to store school paper for my kids all this time. It had a couple of rough edges from just general use, so I decided to give it a light sanding before spray painting it. Taking the leftover of the paint that I used for the lamp, I began to spray paint the tray. I wanted to make sure that all the edges got white spray paint on them, so I started it upside down and then I flipped it later to get the top portion. Now, while I will be covering the bottom of the tray to match the grass cloth look of the original, I did go ahead and spray paint the bottom of the tray because I didn't want that ampersand to show through anything that I applied on the top. So for the next step, I'll be using this faux grass cloth contact paper that I purchased on Amazon. And it's very similar to the one that I used on the free Facebook Marketplace side table flip that I shared a little while ago. This one though is a little bit darker when it comes to the grass cloth color, but it's very similar in quality as the other one. Next, all I did was take the measurements of the inside of the tray and I actually did this to both this inside top portion that you see me measuring right here, as well as the underneath portion. I wanted this tray to look as finished and polished as possible, and I didn't want the bottom just to have the overspray from the spray painting of the sides. I wanted it to have the grass cloth as well. I used scissors to cut my pieces from the roll, but then I did use a straight edge and my box cutter to make a nice crisp straight line for the edges. I made sure to dry fit everything before I began applying the contact paper. And then of course I took my time in putting the contact paper on. Now this part can be pretty tedious, but I take a small portion of the contact paper off at the end first. And as I continue applying, I continue pulling the backing from the contact paper. So I'm trying to smooth everything out first. And sometimes I use my Cricut spatula. It really does help. And I just smooth everything out before removing that backing. And it really does help give me a nice, smooth, wrinkle-free surface. I did the exact same thing to the bottom of the tray and here you can see the little felt pads that I add to the bottom of the tray so that it protects any surfaces that I put my tray on. And here is how it turned out.
So let's see how we did. The original piece was $298 and my tray only ended up being $12 for everything. For this next look for Les Dupes, we're going to be recreating this Adele Sore Candle Holder from Serena and Lily at $198 for the small one. Now, they had several sizes, however, we're only going to focus on the small one and we're not going to do the beaded detail simply because it was very difficult to try to achieve and honestly, I just think the silhouette of this is timeless. And for this to start, we're going to be using these tread wheels from Hobby Lobby. And this package costs $4.99. It comes with four of them. We're also going to be using some wooden rings. And this is actually left over from when I created these beautiful poinsettia napkin rings for my Christmas in July video. So for the smaller ones that I was able to recreate. What I did was I took my miter shears and I cut a sliver off the edge of the round. And the reason I did this was because I needed it to stand straight and flat on the surface so it can have better adhesion when I glued it on to the bottom base. So obviously for the smaller candle holder, you're just going to need one large wooden ring and then the two tread wheels. Then of course you're going to do the same thing to the other side of that wooden ring to create another flat surface for the top portion of the candle holder. And you can use a mini saw and a sanding block to make any adjustments and make it even more smooth. Now the bottom tread wheel needs to be face down so that there's more surface area that you can glue the wooden ring on. The one on the top needs to face up. That means that little indentation that it has needs to face upwards again so that the underneath portion has a more surface area to glue and attach onto the wooden ring. Now I would probably recommend wood glue for this but you can definitely use a hot glue gun and it does hold pretty well. Do the base first and then come in and do the top and I even use a level just to make sure that it was nice and even on all sides. So next, once the glue had dried, it was time to paint and I decided to use White Swan from a DIY paint. And I decided to go with this instead of the spray paint because this actually has a better coverage on raw wood than spray paint does. Sometimes raw wood likes to suck up the paint, but this one, as you can see, has really good coverage and I only needed to do one coat of paint. And that was pretty much it. All I had to do was let the paint dry and here is how it turned out. So the result is the originals were $198 and I was able to create two for just six. So I came across these Modern Farmhouse striped indoor outdoor pillows at Pottery Barn and normally they are $49.50 per pillow. I love refreshing my home for the seasons with new pillow cushion covers and I thought this would be really great especially since I love a blue and a bonus this is actually a non-sewing DIY. Now I find these cushion covers at Hobby Lobby all the time and these are only $5.49. These are a simple beige looking linen type cushion cover and they are a good size and they are also have a zipper back so they're very well made. Now these go on sale for 50% off all the time and that's when I purchased these. So instead of paying $5.50 per cushion cover I only paid $2.75 for each one. Now before I started, I made sure to iron the pillow cover. That way I had a nice, smooth, even surface to work on. Then I used my fabric tape measure to help me find the center and create the large center stripe. I simply used some washi tape that I had on hand for this. After I laid down my center stripe, then I did both smaller stripes on either side of the center one. And I use my fabric tape measure to give me the width between both sets of tape.
since I was going with navy blue, I went with the color Hey Sailor from DIY Paint. And with a stencil brush, I began to apply the paint onto the cushion. DIY paint can go on just fine on fabric as well as your furniture. And it is available on my website if you guys wish to try this out. Now what I would do is I would dip the paintbrush into the paint and then I would dab off a little bit of paint in like a plastic container before applying it on to the fabric. And I was just stippling it on. Now you can always use a fabric paint for this as well. Now when applying paint like this on some fabric, it is best to spray it down and wet it down. However, I was afraid that I was going to get bleed through underneath the tape if I did that. So I did not add water before I painted. Now this ended up giving my paint a like unique effect and you'll see what I'm talking about in just a minute. Now I'll be honest, it was definitely not an effect I was going for, but I thought it was pretty cool how it ended up looking in the end. Now if you try something like this, make sure that you place cardboard or poster board inside of the pillow cushion cover. That way the paint doesn't transfer on to the other side of your pillow. Then once the paint was completely dry, I took the DIY paint clear wax and with a lint free cloth, applied it all over my painted areas. And I let this dry overnight. The following day, I removed all of the tape. Then I took a very stiff stencil brush and just wiped all over those painted stripes. I wanted to make sure that I would buff out that wax and just kind of work it in further into that fabric. And this gave it a nice glossy sheen by going over it like this. Now this part is optional, but I wanted to make sure that the paint was completely set. So I took it to my heat press. Of course, you can do this with an iron, no problem. You just gotta make sure that you have some parchment paper between the iron and the actual cover. But I just kind of went over it a couple times, making sure that everything was nice and set. That way I didn't have to worry about any bleed through or anything coming off of the pillow cushion cover. And here is how they turned out. All right, so for the original pillow, it was $49.50 and I was able to make two of them for $10. For this next look for less, I'm going to be recreating the Sebastian footed planter from Pottery Barn and the small one goes for $229. I love how it's raised and I also love how it has that cement look. So I wanted to try and recreate it. So I found these two pieces at my local Goodwill. The candle holder was $4.99, but I was not gonna pay for that. And it just so happens that it was 50% off that day on red tags. So I was able to get this for only $2.50. Now the bowl did not have a price at all whatsoever. So the gentleman at the register gave it to me for only 99 cents. Now the first thing I needed to do was give it a good cleaning and what I usually do is I use this alcohol spray that I have on hand and that just gets anything that's sticky off of it because I will be gluing these two pieces together and I need a nice clean surface so that it would adhere properly. Once it was all nice and clean, I applied some E6000 to the underneath part of the bowl. Now the best part about this is that this bowl had a little round ridge on the bottom of it and the candle holder fit perfectly inside that circle. So I press it down and I let it sit overnight. The following day I took some Rust-Oleum primer and I spray painted everything making sure that I removed that slick surface so that I can continue with the rest of my paint job. Then I took some DIY paints letterpress gray. Now this gray I had left over from when I redid the little red buffet and turned it into this beautiful two-tone piece for my dining room. 
I started stippling it on, but it wasn't giving me the effect I wanted or the look, so I just rubbed everything all over with my little brush. I just kept spreading that paint over and over again. I wanted to use as little gray as possible, so I would go in and pull from the center of the bowl, and then I would apply it on the outside until I didn't have much more to pull from, and then I began getting it from the can. And I did this because I wanted it to be kind of dry and I wanted it to have streaks so that it would start giving me that concrete texture. After that first layer was dry, I took some of the letterpress gray as well as some of my white swan that I had on hand. And then with a stippling brush, I kind of mixed them at the center, not all the way because I wanted that variation. And then I began just stippling the paint on leaving uh, some parts untouched, other parts with a little bit of a heavier hand, and I just varied the amount of paint that I applied throughout, as well as the different colors. I wanted it to look like a faux cement piece. You can go as heavy handed with the variations, you can change up the color to make them a little bit more darker, or use more earthy tones, but I absolutely love doing this technique to get that stone finish. To add even more texture, you can stipple a larger amount of paint, and then you can immediately use a hair dryer or a gun to dry that paint out really quickly with that texture. And it will give you those rough little slight bumps on the surface of your little footed bowl. And I did this over and over again to kind of build up that texture and it worked beautifully. For the very end, I just added a couple of felt pads or feet underneath it so it wouldn't scratch my surface and here is how it turned out. All right, so for the original, it cost $229, and for my version, it only cost me $3.50 for the candle holder and bowl that I had to purchase. Now for this next one, I am gonna be recreating this faux berry kissing ball from Pottery Barn. It is a holiday piece, but it is so worth checking out because it turned out beautifully. So I got this larger ornament at Dollar Tree and I picked the red one on purpose so I wouldn't have to paint it if it were like a white styrofoam ball. Now I needed to remove the top little lip that goes underneath the holder to hang it because it needed to be nice and smooth. So my husband <laughs> found a saw and he was able to cut it off for me. Now I wanted to add the ribbon to the inside of the ornament to hold it up. And I would have actually used a more solid red ribbon, but they didn't have anything at Dollar Tree that did not have any print on it. So I just settled for this see-through one, which still worked. And all I did was hot glue it to the inside like that, and later on I will cover that hole. Now this one's gonna be a little bit more tedious because you're gonna have to adhere each and every berry individually onto the ornament. And I started at the top rim and I began working my way around and down. And once I get about halfway done, I like to flip it around and maybe put it in a little bucket or a cup and then work my way back up to the other side of the ornament. And in closing the hole where the ribbon is, is actually very easy. I would just add one berry at a time, wait till it dries, and I'd add another one until the hole closed completely. Once everything was secure, I came in with some red acrylic paint and made sure to paint everything so it was nice and uniform in color and you couldn't see those white specks throughout. Once that was dry, I'd come back in with the glossy Mod Podge and I'd give it one full coat. And that was it for this DIY.
And so the Pottery Barn version was $69 for the large ball, and mine only cost me $7.50. All right, I know this is another holiday one, but this is so totally worth it. I came across these Nutcrackers on Pottery Barn's website, and I immediately fell in love. I'm not usually a fan of the colorful Nutcrackers, but these were just my style. The smaller one costs $59, while the larger one costs $79. However, I came across these unfinished wood Nutcrackers at the local Dollar Tree, in the higher price section and these are going for only three dollars a piece and for this i am going really simple i am using some leftover old brown acrylic paint that i had on hand and adding some water to water it down to create a stain but you are welcome to use any kind of stain that you already have on hand or you can even brew some coffee and you can use that and now you will find that because it's unfinished wood, it might soak up the stain and it might look a lot lighter once it dries. So what I did is I actually waited till it dried and gave it another coat to deepen the stain. And that worked pretty well. I could have done it the third time if I wanted it darker too. After that, all you have to do is let it dry and enjoy. I mean, how much simpler can you get? The originals were $118, and for the pair of mine, I only spent six bucks. Now, these Ballard Designs Trickum Wheat Stacks are perfect for late summer and all through fall, and I just fell in love with them. And on sale, the smallest one was going for $23.20. Now, when I was at Hobby Lobby, I found this grass that had been dried in the dried floral section and it was $7.99 originally however it was on sale for 40% off. Now this had quite a bit of grass so I began to unwrap everything and then start pulling small pieces out. I was determined to make both of the pieces with just this one bundle of dried grass. So I began to pull each stem individually and began to hold them down with my other hand to make a nice tight bundle. Now once I was done gathering the amount that I needed for the smaller one, I came in with some shears and I cut the stems down. Now I needed these to stand on their own. So I took the pieces that I cut off, measured them so that they would be a little bit shorter then the entire stems on the arrangement and began to cut all of the pieces that I cut off down to that size. I was hoping to bulk up the actual base of the arrangement so it had a little bit more uh, girth and it could stand up on its own. Once I was done cutting them all down, I kind of spread the ones that were on the outside, laid the smaller stems on the inside, and then wrapped the rest around so that it would cover those stems that had no tops to them. I held them down with one hand so that they wouldn't come apart and then with the other one I actually used the rubber band from the packaging to hold it together. I trimmed any excess off the bottoms to make everything nice and even. And then there was some loose pieces of, I guess, the tops of the wheatgrass. And so what I did was I hot glued those bottoms of them right on top of some of the pieces that I had cut down and put in the center for that added width. That way you wouldn't see any little sticks from the top of the arrangement either. Now I did feel like it was still in need of a little bit more sticks, so I just kept adding more from the bottom until I was happy with how it felt and how it stood. The originals had a type of jute string around it, but I thought it would be nice to add this green velvet, the one that I used in my Christmas in July video, just so that everything could tie in together and I just wrapped it around and hot glued it and that was it for this. Now I did want to note that it was just as easy to make the larger arrangement. I used the rest of the wheatgrass in order to make it. I just cut the pieces at a longer length this time 
and then I proceeded to do the same steps with adding a more width to the stem so it would hold it up better. And here is how both of them turned out. And so here's how we did. For theirs, I would have paid $43.20 for the pair. And for my pair, I only spend $4.79 total. Here is another Pottery Barn a dupe for you. And these are decorative birds on wooden stands. I absolutely love how these look. They start at $19.50 a piece, but you can get the set for $69. And I think we can do better than that. And since we do a lot of DIYs in our home, we actually had this post in our yard, just out in the yard, okay? Don't judge. But we had it out there, it wasn't being used, and I thought, let's cut it down and create some of these little stands for these birds. And my husband was very kind to do this for me. Now the three sizes that I asked him to cut were four inch, six inch, and an eight inch cut. And he actually further trimmed off the edges to make them a little bit smaller and more square. I didn't get that footage because I was working on the birds while he was working on that. But that's what he did and as you can see here, I am just sanding off the exterior of them trying to get that bright brand new wood to just be nice and smooth and ready for stain. Once they were all sanded down nice and smooth, I began to stain them. And what I used was just regular stain by Verithane and it was the color early American. This was stain that was left over from previous projects and so I decided to go ahead and use it and I love the color that it gives to this wood. It's a nice rich color but it's not too dark and it's not too yellow. Now as for the birds, you can get any kind of birds you want but I did want something nice and smooth and ceramic looking. Now I got these from Hobby Lobby and they were all 50% off. However, you can always go to a thrift store and see if they have any there. You'll get them even cheaper. Now, I wanted them to look just like the ones from Pottery Barn. However, you can paint these any color you want that suits your decor. Now for this spray paint, I use Krylon Color Master in the flat black. I actually purchased this at Hobby Lobby and it was a little bit more expensive than what I would normally pay for a spray paint. However, I will say it was $7 original and I got it at 30% off because it happened to be on sale when I bought it. Now I usually buy the Rust-Oleum spray paint which is a little bit less expensive. However, hands down, this is probably my favorite spray paint now. This stuff says it dries in less than 10 minutes and it absolutely does. As a matter of fact, it took less than 10 minutes to dry. And it was probably because I was outside and it was kind of warm, but the finish and the speed at which this dries is amazing and it doesn't stay tacky to the touch. So honestly, for a couple more dollars than what I normally would spend, it's definitely worth the investment to get a higher quality spray paint that paints and dries so much faster. So once the wood pieces and the birds were dry, I brought them in and I needed to adhere them together. Now what I used was Gorilla Glue because I wanted to make sure that they stuck and did not come off. So how did we do? Their set was $69 and I was able to recreate the entire look for only $22. If you haven't noticed, I like Pottery Barn and we're going to be recreating these recycled wood candle holders. Now for a set of three at Pottery Barn, you would pay $199, which I think is kind of crazy. But I really love this and I knew I can recreate this for so much less. Now if you have a keen eye, you probably noticed that when I was staining these pieces earlier, there were five pieces. So my husband actually cut two more pieces for me 
when he cut the ones for the little birds and I asked him to cut them in a six inch and an eight inch as well for this project. Once these were dry, I brought them in and I got some of these little craft squares from my Dollar Tree. Now the pieces in the original piece were metal, but I don't weld, so wood it is. So I decided to cut these down just under the entire size of the width of these little pillars. You'll see me here marking it. I wanted to make sure it was just a little bit inside of the edge. And since these are fairly thin, I wouldn't cut these with the big miter saw outside, so I brought them in and used my little miter box kit and cut these down to size. After they were cut, I sanded the edges down to remove any splinters and I rounded off the edges a little bit with my sandpaper. Now for this project, I did buy some of these wood rounds. This comes in a pack of four for only $3.49 at Hobby Lobby. I also purchased a round dowel for a little under a dollar and I cut these two pieces with my little crafting shears. I sanded the ends of the dowel that I had cut off just to make sure everything was nice and smooth, but also to make sure that the dowels were nice and level at the ends and would stand up straight. Now for this piece, I wanted to glue the little dowel onto the square piece and then the little round part on top of the dowel and I use Gorilla Glue to do this. You want to make sure you glue the little dowel piece on the center of both the square and the circle. If not, when you put a candle on it, it will fall over. <laughs> and at first you saw me kind of removing the excess glue with my little Q-tip whenever it would spill over after pushing the two pieces together. However, I realized that unfortunately it wasn't holding as good, but then I left it that way because once I paint it, it's going to look like it was a welded edge. So it was okay that it was remaining a little bit messy with the glue kind of seeping out. Now the goal of this is to make it look like metal. So I'm using my brush metal full guard paint in the color brushed black in order to get this effect. And what I did was instead of brushing the paint on it, I would dab it with my brush. I didn't want any brush strokes to give it away that it was not a metal piece. And honestly, the rough surface added it to the metal look. Now this paint covers very well and you only need to use one coat. Just make sure to get all of the surfaces, including the bottom of the round wood piece. You want to make sure that after you do this, you let it sit for a while so that the paint can dry as well as the glue. So once everything is nice and dry, then you want to go and add some Gorilla Glue underneath and adhere it onto the top of one of your pillars. As you can see, I have some gold thumbtacks. These I've had for a while and I've just been using them on different projects and all I needed to do was hammer them down on all four corners. Next, I just took that same brushed metal black paint and painted over all of those thumbtacks so that way they looked like metal nails. And that was it for this DIY. So for the final breakdown, theirs was $132 and mine was only $5.50. I love these Valor Design mirrors and I always wanted to recreate them. These were going for about $132 for the pair, I believe. And little did I know that department stores like Ross and TJ Maxx sometimes create these for much cheaper. They may come in Maybe not so pretty colors, but they do recreate duplicates for lesser prices. So I decided to give these a makeover and make them look like the higher end versions. The first thing I needed to do was to take apart these mirrors. That way I can have the trellis portion by itself. And as you can see, it was really easy to take apart. Once that was done, I took some white chalk paint and began to paint the perimeter of the frame. Now, once that is dry, we're gonna work on the inside of the trellis frame. And for this, I'm just using a Martha Stewart brown paint that I had on hand. 
I made sure to cover every single corner because I did not want any of that blue to peek through. After the brown paint was dry, I came in with some clear wax and began to apply wax to the entire frame. Once I was done with the wax, I let it dry. Now I could have left it just like this because Valor Designs does have a white version of these, but I decided to take it one step further and use the aged glaze that I had on hand so I can give the perimeter a weathered wood look. Now I used a stippling brush for this and I didn't need a ton on my brush. I just did it in long straight strokes and as you can see here in this close up, it really does give that white chalk paint a wood finish. I let that dry and then it was all a matter of putting everything back together again. I gave the mirrors a nice clean and just reassembled them together. And here is how they turned out. So in comparison, theirs was $263.20 for a pair, and for mine, I only paid $8 a piece, so it was only $16 for my set. Now because this next look for less is a very old look for less, I could not find the original image of the listing online for this bone tray. All I could come up with was this still photo of the intro of the original video where I had created it. So I thought I would just go ahead and put it in here so you can take a look at what the original looked like. The original price for this was $2.75 and I knew I could do better. Now for this, I decided to use those tumbling tower game blocks from Dollar Tree. Everybody was using these for so many different DIYs. And I thought that I can create something very classy with these. And this ended up being a subscriber favorite. Now I took some acrylic paint in kind of like a bone color. And what I did was I began to paint individual pieces. However, I was not going to paint all of them. Now the key here is to not paint this solid. You do want a little bit of that wood grain to shine through. Now once you have painted what it seems like to be a crazy amount of them, then you're gonna take some Elmer's glue and you're gonna begin to glue these side by side and next to each other, just like I'm showing you here, alternating one wood and one white, one wood and one white. Now you can make this as wide or as narrow as you want. Now in order to add a stability to my piece, I decided to use a frame from Dollar Tree that was just a single piece and I decided to line up those pieces so that I can create a tray off of it. Again, this is just for extra stability. You don't have to do this. You can always do it with cardboard or even a piece of wood underneath. Now the key here is to alternate them as well on the tray. So you want to start one with white and one with wood. Now what I did here for even more stability was glue them onto each other and then onto the actual board so that it had a double adhesion. And you wanna make sure that they are nice and snug. Next, we're gonna focus on the perimeter of the tray and we're gonna do some more painting. Again, you're gonna alternate. But this time, instead of just painting the face, you're gonna to wanna to paint the edges of these because we're gonna put them on the flatter side toward each other, showing off the narrower side to the exterior, if that makes sense. So here I am stacking them and gluing them all together, making sure that I alternate the colors. Once I had all of my perimeter pieces, I did a dry run just to make sure that everything fit nice and snug. And then what I did was I sanded all of the edges of the original tray piece just to make sure that everything is nice and even and flat so that when I adhere them onto the bottom part, it will be nice and flush. Now, because I wasn't planning on using this tray for holding anything actually heavy, all I did was use hot glue, but you can always use wood glue for extra security. Next, I cut down some small square dowels so that I can create the handles it was a very simple design and once I glued them together, all I did was paint it with a brushed bronze color to make it look like it was actually metal. You can always use something a little bit more sturdy, but again, I wasn't gonna use this to actually hold heavy items or lift it up by the handles. I just wanted it for display on a shelf. 
Finally, I added Mod Podge to everything to kind of seal it all in. I added the handles and here is how it turned out. So at the end, theirs cost $275 versus mine, which only cost me $7 for all of my materials. It's nice to look for less. I was feeling a little adventurous, and I came across these faux paper whites on Ballard Design's website. This was for $103, but I realized that it was just for the plant and not for the base. So I decided to go around their website to see if I can find something similar so that I can recreate it as well, along with the florals. I came across this little piece and it looked like the one that they had the paper whites in so I decided to recreate this look as well. I came across these pieces at my local Goodwill at this time and I thought that if I put them together I can recreate that little vessel. Now in order to add the look of the dots I decided to use these stickers from Dollar Tree. First thing I did was clean off the vessels very good with alcohol and then using E6000 I decided to glue both pieces together. Once the glue was dry and everything was set I took it outside and spray painted it with white spray paint. Now this is what it looked like so far but I wasn't done yet. I needed to add those dots from those stickers that I showed you earlier. I decided to have fun with this, especially since they were very easy to put on because they had like a little mesh in between them. And once I had them where I wanted them, I took this back outside to spray paint completely in white again. Now I have these florals from Dollar Tree that I plan on using for this floral arrangement. Now I didn't need the entire piece, so I cut out individually the stems that I was gonna use for this one in particular. Then I got some foam for the vase, as well as three little Easter eggs. I cut them in half because these are going to be part of the bulbs for the paper whites. Now you're going to cut them at both ends so that they look like this. Then I got some of that packing paper that they give you at Hobby Lobby when you have glass or ceramics in your bag. I crumpled it up and then I cut them down into smaller little square pieces. And then I glued the eggs inside of each of these little papers. I also made sure to hot glue the sides and then to bring up the papers as I went. And I did this to the entire perimeter of the egg. This is what it'll look like towards the end. Now you can always snip off some excess pieces like I did here because I thought that they were just a little bit too long. Next with some brown acrylic paint I began to paint the exterior of these little bulbs. Once they were dry I adhered them onto the styrofoam round. Once they were glued on, I added the green moss from Dollar Tree to cover up the styrofoam. And then I took those florals and I inserted them in each of the bulbs. I added hot glue to the tips of them before I inserted them so that they would stay secure. I adhered the styrofoam into the little urn that I created and then I went back in to touch up some areas where I thought were necessary, but that was basically it for this look for less.
The final breakdown for this is as follows. Theirs was $166 for both the paper whites and the little urn, and mine only ended up costing me a total of $9. Now I love this little piece so much that you might have noticed when I did the reveal of my son's bathroom at our last house, I even used it to decorate it in there and as part of the reveal. For the next high-end dupe, we are looking at these green fern leaf art pieces, again from Ballard Designs. Now these range from $220 up to $449 a piece, depending on the size that you wish to get. Now these were beautiful, I love the frame, I love the texture, but these are a little over my budget. I had originally thought about using this color of vinyl, but it was a little bit too light and I already had some on hand, also from Cricut that was a little bit deeper and richer in color and I thought it would look really good against the other original piece, which was more of that shade. I went online in search for the perfect fern PNG image and I was able to find it on a free website as well. I downloaded it and then I uploaded it to my Cricut Design Space. Everything was perfect and I didn't really need to tweak it that much at all. So I just selected cut image and then I uploaded it to my current project. I made sure to size it correctly and that it would fit in the frame that I had planned for this. This was pretty large so it will need a larger mat and I selected a premium vinyl for this as well. And then I sent it to cut on my Cricut. Once it was cut, it was time to weed. I set the leaves aside and began to work on my frame. Now I've had these frames for quite some time and I have not done anything with them. I got them several years ago at Michael's and I believe they were at like a 60% off sale. I think it was like a Black Friday and I think I got these for anywhere between $10 and $12 if I remember correctly. You can find any kind of frame in your thrift store or some really good deals when they go on sale in your local craft stores. Now I wanted to replicate the frame of the original piece as much as possible so the first thing I did was tape it down. And then since the inner portion of the frame on the original piece was gold, I decided to go ahead and use some rub and buff and apply it to the entire inside piece of the frame. I did this to both frames and as soon as they were dry I removed the tape. Once all of that tape was removed, it was time to add more. This time I'm covering the gold portion that I had already painted so that I can paint the outer portion black. For this, I used a simple black chalk paint that I had in my stash that I wanna go ahead and use up. Next, I took some poster board from my dollar store. Now, we're gonna be using the dull back side of the poster board and not the shiny side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start folding it in order to get the desired size that I want for my ferns. I'm not going to cut it because the original piece looked like it had jagged edges around the paper that the fern was placed on. So what I'm going to do is what we used to do when we were all young is fold the edges over and over again so that we can break it apart in a nice line but still have that rough edge. And what I'm going to do is since it's poster board I'm going to use a little bit of water to moisten that edge that I fold over so that it can cut easier. And using the leaf as my guide, I knew exactly where I needed to make the creases to make the paper smaller. Using my Cricut spatula, I flattened that edge and then I would come in with my misting bottle and just wet those edges so that the edge can be nice and soft for when I decide to rip it. As you can see, it's got that nice rough edge, but it's still pretty straight. And of course, I kept on folding and removing the excess poster board that I did not need. When those were ready, I used some transfer tape to apply the fern leaf onto the poster board section. Next, I removed the tape from the frames and I touched up anywhere that it needed it. 
and I use some of my clear wax to seal the frames. Next, I cut a second piece of poster board to match the size of the entire frame and I'm using the back of the frame as a guide. I place the attached leaf on top of that new poster board and with some double sided tape, I adhere that onto the second larger piece. I do my best to place it right on the center before making sure that the tape catches on. And then I place everything inside of the frame. Once everything was secured, this is how this one turned out. So the final verdict on this one is if I would have gotten their pair, I would have paid $440, but for mine, I only spent $32 for my set. Well, that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below which one of these Look For Less dupes was your all-time favorite. As you know, I have a cottage that I am still finishing out and I still have to decorate. So I will be coming with even more look for less ideas this year for you all. Also stay tuned because we have some updates on what's going on on the farm and I don't want you to miss out on them. I hope you guys are doing great and I will see you all in the next video. Until then, adios.